Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. Um, please ask questions as I talk. Uh, I'd much rather it's a conversation rather than me just wittering on. Um, but I'm going to start showing you that slide. Um, I was born in the uh, late 50s, and this uh, scheme was developed also in the 50s by a wonderful uh, innovator called Buckminster Fuller who, if you don't, haven't heard of, go and look him up, because he's really quite interesting. And this was a, a plan uh, to roof Manhattan with a kind of biosphere. And it was the beginning of humanity's interest in enclosing big span spaces. The idea was taken on a little bit further in the early 70s with uh, another really interesting architect, Fry Otto, uh, working with Bureau Happold, and this was in the beginning of the, I think, the first oil crisis. And this idea was to roof a mining village in Alberta, up in Canada, uh, to create a village that people could work in all year round, so they could mine the oil shale up in uh, the outback in Canada. And the idea really was to make an equitable climate for people to live and work in. What was interesting about it, it was the very first time the ETFE was ever proposed to be used as an architectural material. Um, it was, uh, as I say, developed by Happolds. They came across the material. The material was invented by uh, DuPont, working for NASA in the 50s, because when NASA was putting, beginning to put spacecraft up into orbit, they found that the electrical insulin was degrading under cosmic radiation, and they were using PVC, and so they asked DuPont to come up with, as it were, a, a long-life insula insulation. And DuPont took another material that they had invented, I think, by accident in the 20s, called PTFE, which I'm sure you've heard about. It's the covering to the glass fabric on the Millennium Dome, and they added ethylene to it, and they basically make PTFE so you could melt it. And because you could melt it, you could extrude it into these thin films. So Happolds and Fraiotto came up with the idea of using ETFE in architecture, 51 degrees north. We came across it because we were interested in sailing boats in the 80s. And we were looking at a replacement for polyethylene, or mylla, which is used to create high-tech race boat sails. And uh, the problem with uh, Myla is it degrades under UV light, so you have a very short life to these uh, high-tech racing sails. Oh, what happened there? How do I make it go back? And um, uh, so we started, we, we basically invented how you weld ETFE. And um, that took a really long time and was very difficult because we're trying to join bits of material which are only like 100 micron thick and put full structural stability through it. So it was a really difficult thing to do. And no one else really managed to do it for about 20 years. And that was really good for us because we brought this technology into the architectural world and we had to have enough space to make mistakes because when you bring a new technology, you do make mistakes. We were very lucky with our first clients. This was a, a wonderful client called uh, Van Hoff in Holland. And this is a little uh, tropical rainforest. It's a building over a mangrove house. And the client uh, had built a building in FEP, which was another fluoropolymer, which had failed because FEP tears. And he had asked us, he'd heard about our work with uh, sales, and he asked us to come in and reclad this building, and we did. And this was built in 1982. It's the very first building in the world ever clad in ETFE. ETFE is completely different to fabric. People often think it's the same sort of thing. And I put this slide up because it showed, this, we did this on the South Bank, it's since been demolished. But these orange things are fabric, and they work because they are pulled in tension and patterned into this curvaceous shape, and that stops it flapping in the wind. You can do that with ETFE, but if you put very much load onto it, it creeps and gets longer and elongates and ends up flapping in the wind. 
So typically, we tend to use it like this as a cushion where we inflate air into it. And the air stops the material flapping in the wind and stabilizes it. And by default, you get insulation. So we invented a cladding system which gives you, which can be used as part of the permanent building envelope. So there's a whole series of accidents that all came together to create this. That's a typical cushion, three layers here. And you can see the air being trapped between the layers. You don't. You start with two, if you want to have air in it, and then you might have, say, five layers. But the, the more layers you have, the more insulation you have. Yeah? Now, you're all architects, or you're all learning to be architects, and the big deal about architecture is we're dealing with, with big sums of money, you know, millions of pounds. People invest in real estate. And on the whole, the real estate industry tends to be extremely conservative. So, you know, we come along, we say, look, that's a great project, you know, you're going to invest 10 million in it, why don't you roof it in plastic bags, yeah? And they look at you as if you're completely mad. And we were very lucky because, um, we, A, we were the only people in the market, but also we had this client, this was Centre Parks. And Centre Parks were just starting to build these big domes where they were basically creating tropical environments in, in Northern Europe. And they were really successful. Um, and, you know, thousands of Dutch and English and German tourists used to flood here and drink gin and tonics and get their kids into the pool and basically chill out for a week. You know, 90% occupancy. And uh, Centre Parts loved the ETFE. And they had a very interesting uh, 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 issue. They actually had two domes in Holland. One was covered in ETFE and one was covered in polycarbonate. And both of them had hot dog stands. And they noticed after about six months that the hot dog stand in the polycarbonate dome was selling like 30 hot dogs a day. And the one in the ETFE was selling like 500 hot dogs. And they just didn't understand it. You know, what, you know was it this, you know, the really kind of, this one was dirty and that one was clean, or that one had a nice person, that one had a nasty person. And they started wondering why this was going on. And they found that, that people stayed in the ETFE dome for about three or four hours. Yeah? Whereas people were only staying in the polycarbonate dome for about an hour. And the reason they found was the noise. The ETFE lets the noise out. And so people are kind of in a much quieter environment and they're chilled out. The kids don't notice it, because so the pools were both full of water. But the adults really noticed it. And so they would stay long enough to buy the kids a hot dog in one pool, whereas in the other pool they'd just get out there and you know, go to the bar or go and do something else. We did a lot of these sorts of uh, projects, and we're still building them. I mean, big leisure pools in Northern Europe. It's still an important part of our market. We did this for about five years, building these pools. And the good thing for these clients is they were getting their money back in about 10 years, so they were prepared to take risk. And then this project came on the market. This is Chelsea Hospital. And you're all young really, but we used to have this wonderful Prime Minister called Margaret Thatcher here. And Margaret Fa Thatcher was um, a very caring person and she was coming up for election and she wanted to have a hospital to say, look, I care for the sick and the poor. So she commissioned this from some architects called Shepard Robson. And they came up, with, uh, the hospitals you probably don't know, but they're basically templates and you have a kind of ward template and a mortuary template and a kind of A&E template and you, you string all these templates along this concept called a hospital street and the hospital street is how you get food in and visitors in and flowers in and dead people out you know it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of how hospitals work and Shepherd Robson had quite an interesting idea because they, they, they instead of having a street they had this very big atrium and the atrium was uh, designed to be heated and cooled by the sun. And you can see it here. And all of the windows of the hospital opened up into this atrium. So there's a problem about how do you roof this? You wanted to roof it with something which let, let the heat in to heat up the space, which was very insulative. And we came up with the idea of ETFE. 
and it went through extensive testing to see whether it would last a long time because the hospital had a 60-year design life. We had all sorts of interesting discussions. Like, um, I remember going to a meeting a bit like this with lots of doctors. And the doctor sort of said, well, Mr. Morris, why would we like to roof our building in ETFE? So I went, blah, 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 and told them all the kind of stuff I'm telling you. And I, what a fancy stuff it was. And somebody at the back said, because um, it was right in the middle of the AIDS crisis, and he said, look, what happens if you get the AIDS virus inside the cushions? And the room, which had kind of been quite into this building, suddenly went kind of icy cold. It's like... God, what happened? Shit, the AIDS virus up there, you know, <laughs> in the hospital. <laughs> and Margaret Thatcher, she just bought the bloody thing, you know, <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> I, I, I didn't know, how, how do you answer a question like this? I mean, you'll have presentations, but this was really hard. And uh, there's a wonderful guy at the back, and he just said, look, relax, you know, it's a condom. <laughs> <So> <laughs> it protects you, it doesn't hurt you. <laughs> and the hospital was built, and and basically highly successful, it's still there. <laughs> now, it launched us, you know, because it was like a long life building. We went on, this is uh, Michael Hopkins, and um, uh, we did uh, Schlumberger with him, and invented, in fact, printing graphics on the cushions. Um, this is uh, the cushion here. This is a dot matrix, a kind of printed graphic. And you hear, see here fabric. And this gives you a fairly good idea of relative transparency of these materials. And various other little projects, the Lord Shop, uh, this was David Morley, Architects. Um, and here we put uh, titanium dioxide into the foil. And that's the same stuff you have in uh, suntan lotion. And it turns the material white. And you can put various other pigments into it. And we just started to explore what you could do with it. This was uh, Lorenzo Apicello. He now runs, I think, Pentagram. I think he's still there. The Tellier one, Neil Thomas. Uh, this is still around. This is near the M4, going out of town. And then he started to go around the world. Miami, this hotel in Miami. This is a Pasadena Art School. This is a School of Slavonic Studies in London. And you can see that the cushions are being used in lots of different applications and lots of different shapes. It's beginning to move into architecture. This is Nick Grimshaw in New York. Chris Wilkinson in Liverpool. Uh, this is uh, Chanel, uh, Zaha Hadid, a little uh, pavilion. We did a you know, travelling pavilion for uh, Chanel. But you can see all these different shapes are happening. It's replacing glass. It's beginning to be exploited by creative people like you to solve design problems. And we get some lovely, interesting problems. I mean... Uh, I don't know whether you saw the Olympics, but the flames, when they came up in the middle, it was a lovely thing that uh, a guy called Thomas Heatherwick designed. This was a scheme we did with Thomas Heatherwick in uh, Hong Kong. I call it the ink blot. Um, but it's a cushion that's sort of been dropped from the top of the one, many skyscrapers there to create this very free-form uh, space, completely screwed up by the interior designers who, you know, <laughs> stuff a kitchen there. That's part of architecture. <laughs> um, this is where you go and smoke in Singapore. Um, but the cushions, I mean, fabric I mentioned earlier is this kind of patterned into these, they're called anti-clastic shapes, these tension membranes. The cushions are essentially a planar geometry. You need to have a structure around the edge which holds them. But unlike glass, you can bend it. So we do lots of stuff like this. This is, um, this is Nick Grimshaw in Spencer Street Station. In fact, David Dexter, who's over there, engineered this. Uh, and you can see these 200 metre by 5 metre cushions zipping through the landscape in this kind of moonscape of crinkly tin. Or here, Bradford University, these big curved cushions roofing the entrance shape. And it's such a shame you didn't do it here. You came up with this fairly mediocre scheme, I might say. <laughs> <laughs> or here, the fashion house Jean-Paul Galtier uh, in uh, Chirac's old headquarters in downtown Paris. It's wonderful with a black mirrored floor. And 
exquisite sexualities walking up and down the catwalk. It's really quite something. <laughs> With this minimalist aesthetic, you know, there's no decoration. It is as close to the sky as you can get. And that's very much what we like to do. We like to do more with less. And, I mean, you're all young. Um, but I fly around the world and... You know, Hurricane Sandy devastates New York. Or, you know, in the middle of a presidential campaign. It's like we have to change our practice. And you lot are creating something like 40% of the noxious gases that we pump into the atmosphere in your activities of doing buildings. So you have to change quite fast. Otherwise your children will be dead. I'll be fine anyway because I'll be dead, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I said you can bend it, you can also warp it. So we do many structures like this. You can see this is a kind of a, a blown hemisphere on a fairly freeform plan. So each of these surfaces are warped in space in a way that you can't really achieve with any other planar technology. And you can get very light. This is uh, Rem Koolhaas in Copenhagen. And you can see these warped cushions. And what's really interesting as well is probably something like 50% of the materials we use in buildings and materials to stop the buildings wobbling. People on the whole don't like deflection. Yeah? So, and particularly when you talk to engineers, if it starts to wobble, they say, you know, whack a bit more steel in it and you know, it'll be fine, honestly. <laughs> but this kind of system, because the cushion's full of air here, and this one's full of air, it kind of acts as a spring. So this air stabilizes this bit of steel. The whole thing works together. Yeah? And if you can do that, you can usually take quite big kilograms out of structures. And you can do more with less. And th that's what we have to do. We have to do more with less. It doesn't mean, it isn't about being boring. You don't have to kind of wander around in sackcloth and ashes and, you know, hug trees and do all of this kind of stuff and go and dig up Wimbledon Common or whatever. But you know, it means using our brains. You can do all sorts of interesting things dimensionally. I mean, you can see this very three-dimensional plan. This is the BDP. This is a shopping centre in uh, Scotland. And it's really echoing the street, but instead putting in a climatic envelope. You are actually reducing the surface of the building by more than half. And because you're reducing the surface, you're reducing its energy load. You're also keeping these poor people out of like the driving rain that you get in Glasgow or Edinburgh. You get some nutters. I mean, do you know uh, Ron Arid? Um, a wonderful uh, furniture designer. You, you can see the problem with furniture designers when they stray into architecture. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being rude, but uh, this is actually a wonderful scheme. This is... Uh, uh, a scheme in Liège in uh, Belgium, which was a very run-down part of the city. And they wanted something exceptional to, to raise it and draw people in. And Ron Arad and his uh, colleagues came up with this, uh, a highly complicated structure. We had to go to a shipbuilder to make it, um, with here four layer cushions, uh, because they wanted high insulation. And you see the red, pi red pigment. And this was quite interesting. There was a great debate because when you go to a shop, you want daylight colour rendering because you, know, you buy a nice dress or a nice jacket or something like that and it looks really cool under red light. And you walk out and think, oh my God, <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> so it's kind of an issue. Um, and lots of other... I mean, this, in fact, uh, Will's, Will's kids go to this school. This is... Uh, in Hackney, it's a kind of a, what do you call it, a spree trom trombolet or something? You know, it collects sun. So his children are very suntanned. If you see these suntanned <laughs> kids wandering around, you know where they go. <laughs> it's not because he's beating them, you know. <laughs> um, the material itself is really green. Um, and again, it's something you need to look at when you deal with materials. ETFE is made from a material called feldspar. 
and it comes from, it's a waste product from lead and tin mining. And what you do is you basically copolymerize it and add ethylene to it, which you either get from petrochemical or from bioethanol sources, and you create ETFE. And it's one of the reasons it was specified here. This is um, the Earth Center up in Yorkshire. I think it's closed down because... Well, I'll tell you why, because this is a toilet, and there's a toilet at one end and a drinking tap at the other. And it took them a while to figure out this wasn't a great tourist attraction. But uh, I think they've re remarketed it now. Or well, here, using it as spandrel panels um, for Mazda, the eco-city of Mazda, um, that uh, Norman Foster did although I'm not sure it's very environmentally friendly to build in Abu Dhabi anyway. But, uh, the technology's now moved into every building sector. This is, a, this is quite a nice little roof. Uh, David here engineered it. Um, this is just, if you go into Liverpool Street Station and walk out of the east entrance, you can go down a little lane and through an arch and you see this roof, which encloses a brick courtyard. Uh, here we're roofing the treasury. Um, so it's roofing, you know, the highest buildings of the land are now being covered in plastic bags. Um, and, and it's not because it's cheap plastic bags, but because it's really the most efficient, most cost-effective, the most elegant solution to enclosing space. As you can see, it's a very light touch on a historic building. It's not this hugely detailed, very busy uh, aesthetic you often get with glass. This is Iron Pie in Milan. Um, the building with wonderful reflections. This is uh, the, the regional government, uh, Lombardia. And here in uh, downtown Berlin, the Radisson Hotel, a shopping mall, a big commercial building. And curiously, you have a big fish tank in the Radisson Hotel, so you watch divers go up and down as you eat your breakfast. The grid shell. I'm beginning to go into the territory of the picture I showed you from Buckminster Fuller. I mean, this, I always thought when we developed this technology that it would be used in northern climates where you need transparency and insulation, where you want to protect people from the cold. But this is in Kuwait. This is one of the hottest parts of the planet. And Kuwait, the climate's pretty hostile. And in reality, what people do is they meet in the shopping mall. You know, if you want to date someone, you go to the shopping mall. If you want to buy something, you go there. If you want to eat, you go there. If you have a business meeting, you go there because it's really one of the few places where you have kind of nice public space. And so, what's that? Like yeah, it is a bit like <laughs> Croydon, yeah. <laughs> Similar dress code as well. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that the cushion sort of because it's inflated, it acts a bit like a spring. And this is quite an interesting structure. This is, uh, this is another sort of shopping mall. This is in a little spa town in Germany where um, they don't like shopping, so they bury it underground. And this is the kind of skylight to the shopping mall. And what's interesting about this really is the bicycle wheel. You see this is the axle, this is the rim, and these things that connect the axle to the rim are cables. So by using steel in tension and not in compression, it, come, it becomes something like 20 or 30 times more efficient. So this is an extremely lightweight structure. We inflate the cushions here with air. This uses about um, 100 watts for about 1,000 square meters. And what you get out of it, you're putting some energy into it, but what you get out of it is you get, as it were, a pressurized envelope over your building so there's no air leakage at all and as you know with things like building regulations when you build buildings now you have to pressure test them because of you know to make sure that the, there isn't a lot of energy loss through air leakage 
but very few people pressure test their buildings after about five years. And the real technical problem in the building isn't so much what the materials are, it's how they join each other. If you think about glass, glass is going backwards and forwards inside a gasket all the time. And that gasket gets harder and it becomes you know, brittle and it starts to leak air and sometimes leak water and generally lasts only about 10 to 15 years. The wonderful thing about a cushion is because it's a soft thing, you spread all the movement over its surface, you take it away from the edge, and so you don't get movement there, so you get a very long life. And that sounds very simple, but it's, it's unique to the technology, and it revolutionises how you detail it and how you engineer it. It takes big load. Another thing that's interesting about it is if you have a fire, the hot air punches a hole through it. It doesn't burn. And when you have a big span space, the problem isn't so much fire, it's about smoke. So if you go into a shopping mall, what happens is the fire down the other end, you get this kind of choking, noxious smoke, and it kills you. And so shopping mouths have bloody great fans in them or opening vents or something to get rid of all of this stuff and sprinklers. And again, we were having one of these lateral ideas. I mean, when you go into a street, you don't have sprinklers. You don't have big fans. You just walk down the street, you know, because if there's a fire, it goes away. As soon as you, put, you start putting awnings out from the street and everybody's relaxed about them, it's only when these awnings meet in the middle that there's a problem and the fire brigade get neurotic about it. So we thought, well, why don't we think about a shopping mall as a street with awnings, and the middle bit you take out. If there's a fire, you take it out. Most of the time it's in there, but if there's a fire, you take it out. So we invented a device where we put a hot wire around a cushion, and you press a button, it's like a wire in an electric fire, you press a button, it heats up, and it cuts the edge of the cushion, and uh, it falls down. So you can say your shopping mall, when there's a fire, you press the button, it becomes a street. So you don't need the sprinklers, you don't need the smoke extract, blah, 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 blah. So it's changing the rules. And it's often these kind of interfaces between things where you have these opportunities. It was interesting, we did it on this project here. This is uh, Imperial College, this is uh, down in Exhibition Road. And this is a kind of a lean-to that Foster put on the front of the old building. But the problem was, the, it was a bit like this, you know, but you had architecture there. <laughs> um, this is Westminster, after all. Um, but it had opening windows, just like here. And so when the problem is they put the lean-to on, this wall had to become the fire compartment wall, if this was a building. But if this building was a garden, if there was a fire, they could still have opening windows. And they managed to achieve that by having this smoke venting cushion. Because the material's soft, though, you can still do big opening vents. This one is a school in Bermondsey, and it's about the size of this wall. It just opens. And that's because the material doesn't care about deflection, doesn't care about movement, it just accepts it. And if you think about when you look around, there's lots of big moving things we make. We make big moving bridges. You know, we make the fronts of our ships open up so we drive in and out of them. And yet you guys are all doing architecture and the biggest opening thing you really do is a door. I mean, get real. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you can take the roof off. Or if you don't like it, you just roll it away. Oh, that's my microphone. <laughs> okay, exactly. You can roll it away. And you can do it because the material is soft, it doesn't break, it doesn't tear, it's full of air, so it's a kind of squadgy sponge. And this graph for you engineers <laughs> is the stress-strain graph, you know. What this basically shows is if you pull it, it gets longer. <laughs> and I talked, uh, and it doesn't break, you know, if you pull glass, it breaks. If you pull this, it just gets longer. Big difference. This, I showed you right at the beginning, 
a project called 51 Degrees North that uh, Fry Otter had done with Happels. One of the founding partners of Happels was a guy called Ian Liddell. And he had cut his teeth at your age on Sydney Opera House. And he went on right at the end of his career to design the Millennium Dome, which was a wonderful bit of engineering. But we worked together quite a lot. And he came up with this lovely structure, which is the first of its type in the world. It's a uniaxial cable net. OK? And a, uni a cable nets typically are a bit like fabric structures. They've got cables going in one direction and they've got cables going at right angles to them, and one cable pulls up and one cable pulls down, okay? That keeps the thing static, stops it moving around under wind load. Well, this, as you can see, only has cables going in one direction. So this cable can flop up and down. But it's great because you can pull the, s the cushions up a little bit how you pull the sails up the mast of a boat, which means you can erect it very quickly. And what happens is you put air in the cushion and the air inflates. It wants to make the thing into a cylinder, a shape of maximum mod volume, minimum surface area, and so it acts like a spring. So this is a uniaxial cable net and the biaxial side of it is done by air pressure. Okay, so you're using the, the cushion, as it were, to stabilise the structure to stabilise the cushion. It's a symbiotic structure. And because of that, it's really efficient. You're doing more with less. And it's beautiful. I mean, as the sun goes down, it kisses each of these cushions. And you get, it's like, like somebody playing the piano. And you just get this kind of cascade of light. And we've done quite a lot of other ones now. We've built about 10 of these around the world. This is in Bristol. Uh, and this is, uh, this is the department of... Uh, What's it? Alcohol, tobacco and firearms, which I thought is a, quite an interesting comment on American culture. <laughs> you have a drink, have a smoke, shoot the shit out of someone. It's, uh, <laughs> this mustn't go on YouTube. <laughs> um, uh, but this was... A <laughs> this, was a, this connects two buildings for, as, a, as I say, the uh, uh, building in Washington. And they went through a lot of research here to kind of how does it work in a uh, uh, case of explosions, because this was conceived shortly after 9-11. And you can see this wonderful uh, three-dimensional form of these fairly parallel cables. Um, we took the concept a bit further with uh, uh, an architect, you probably know, Rem Koolhaas. Um, he came into the office, I don't know, five years ago, something like this, and we designed this scheme to roof an urban block in Los Angeles um, with a structural concept which was designed or developed by uh, Ted Halford. Interesting chap. He had done a student PhD, I think, in this structural system where you have an arch like this, that you create a series of joints in it. And if you imagine that arch is in compression, and these joints allow the thing to pop outwards. If it's in compression, it wants to fail by each joint popping outwards. And you stop that happening by putting a cable to hold it downwards. It's quite interesting, because if you put load on this side, this lot pokes out, and the cables get more tension on them. So it kind of shuffles the loads around the system and spreads them out. And that's what you want to do with structures to make them work efficiently. Um, we've looked at this and reckon it spans up to about a kilometre, you know, round, round numbers. Um, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less, we'll see. But it's a very interesting lightweight structure, at something like 10 kilos a metre. And as you can see, you can link it together in all these different ways. So this is just looking at whacking one over a football pitch with all these different cables. And we haven't built a really big span one yet, but um, we've built this one. This is about 40 metres. And you can see the tube and the universal joint there, that ball with the cables on it. And here with cushions on it. Well, if you push that side in, the cables become tensioned on that side. There is a point where it can snap through. 
and that's where how it sails. Uh, in reality, on a big span one, you'd put some cables and like, you'd truss this to stop that snap through happening. But when you get environments like uh, Qatar on the World Cup, where you've got 12 or 14 stadia or whatever it is, and you've got to cover that much ground when those people aren't in the pitch or in the football stadia, it becomes really interesting to look at these very big span climatic envelopes. Well, in Qatar, it's not really a problem, if you don't <laughs> mind me saying. <laughs> but, no, you're right. I mean, I'll show you Kazakhstan later on. Uh, Kazakhstan is in a climate which is going from minus 45 to plus 45. And at the bottom of that tent, we're supporting seven tons a metre of snow. So you can support snow. I've looked a little bit at the cables and these very light structures. This is another lovely structure. This is a timber structure. And most timber structures you see look at really great lumps of timber, you know. But what's interesting about this technically is you see here the cushion, this is the cushion extrusion, it's on these little stalks, yeah? There's quite big loads in these cushions, but here the cladding is allowed to free float on the top of the structure. So again, you've got this idea that when you put load on it, it kind of shuffles it around and spreads it over like you kind of put, you know, bread on butter or, or butter on bread. And because of that, the loads become less. So you have these structures which self-stabilise. This was Alistair Katanek, in, in fact, in New Zealand, that structure. We've done all sorts of stuff. I mean, this is Manchester Piccadilly. Um, this, this is an interesting job, actually. You see this uh, tower building here? This is about nine storeys high. And one of the cladding panels fell off it and onto the roof. Well, this is a station, so it was fully occupied. It had, I don't know, two, three thousand people in there. And, of course, everybody freaked out. You know, the station gets closed, everybody gets kicked out, blah, blah, blah. They call us up and say, move your asses up here. My guys, bless them, got a train. <laughs> it took them a while to figure to get use the car. <laughs> but they eventually got there. They lifted this cladding panel off. And the cushion was three layers in this case, like this. And this layer had a big hole in it from the cladding panel. And as soon as they lifted it off, the air pushed this layer up to seal it from inside. The roof self-healed. And of course, they went to see the station manager and said, you know, relax, the roof is self-healed. <laughs> he looked at them like they were crazy. <laughs> um, but it was fine, because it, be it became fully operational straight away. We do a lot of these long-term transport infrastructure projects. If you look at Stansted, if you look at Gatwick, if you look at Heathrow, you see our work. If you look at the National Gallery, you see our work. Very simple, minimalist structures. If you look at the embassy in Istanbul, you see our work, where it was blown up a few years ago. And this, I think, is the only that we've ever done that has been praised by Prince Charles. It's generally the kiss of death for architecture. <laughs> we like doing fun projects. This is a, a little research machine into, you introduce pollutants into this and measure the effects of sun on them. And you have to enclose this with a shell in 20 seconds to stop the experiment. This was a lovely contract. This was to design and build a grape. This is somebody who owns all of this land. So he goes into this thing and he says, this is my land. <laughs> <laughs> what a concept, you know. <laughs> Going to your building and saying, this is my land, as far as you can see. This is a wonderful contract. You know, you, you, you get all these wonderful clients, but this guy, up here somewhere or other, there's a village. You see this? And it was his. And in it was a two-star Michelin restaurant. And to do all the contract negotiations, we used to go for lunch. And it was like seven courses and a different wine with each course. I tell you, we always agreed. <laughs> no contractual disputes. So when you do your part threes, this is, this is the goal. <laughs> Interesting enough here, you see this super transparent foil we've developed. Foil, if you thin it around, is slightly milky. 
not because it hasn't got light going through it, but because some of it is specular. It kind of goes out in the hemisphere. It's got a touch of the sandblasted glass to it. This is a, a non-specular transmitting foil. Again, unique to vector foil tech. Most of the things that I show you are. Now, we've talked a little bit about big span, lightweight structures, doing more with less. We haven't really talked about the cushion so much other than it's this transparent stuff that you can print patterns on. This is quite an interesting building. We did this in Hanover in, uh, I think, 2000, something like that. And here we printed patterns on more than one layer. And by moving the layers towards and away from each other, we can change the amount of light going through a cushion. You see the middle layer here? It goes up and down. Yeah? So the... Huh? How do you With air. You blow air into, you know, into that gap here, and the middle bit goes down to the bottom. Yeah? So it's easy. You're blowing air in there anyway, so you now blow air in two different holes in the thing, and the middle bit goes up and down like a yo-yo, and you've got a building that can react and change to climate. And not only do you change the amount of light going through it, you can change the U-value, because you can go from a three-chamber to a two-chamber cushion, or from a four-chamber to a two-chamber. So you've got, you change the amount of air in there, you change the layers, you change the amount of light coming through, you can react and change the climate. So this building, you know, blacks out. Then they do all the kind of publicity stuff and throw some light at it, and the biggest engineering challenge we've ever did, which was to make a twister inside it. But that's another story. But beginning to use it in a more uh, conventional sense, a roof which is black, which is open which is shut, which is open and shut. A huge shopping centre in Athens, which we did for the, whatever it was, Olympics. The roof, open and shut. Reacting and changing to climate. To minimise the energy usage, maximise <coughs> people's comfort. And a, a thing I never expected, but you know when you walk through a forest, you have that lovely kind of dappled light? It's just really nice. It just kind of, you, a rhythm in your eyes. You have that under these enclosures. It's very comforting. And you probably know, uh, you might have come across, if you haven't, look him up. Alex de Reich, he's now uh, in charge of the Royal College. This was uh, a building we did with him at Kingsdale in Dulwich. And this was a great, interesting building because this was a really shitty school. You know, it's like... You know, you, just, you go to the toilet and get knifed. It was like one of those kinds <laughs> of places. And, uh, you know, they spent years and years and years getting a really big grant to do the place up. And uh, then they decided in their wisdom not to do the place up at all, but to put a stinking great roof over the hole in the middle. <laughs> and then they went back to the people with the money and said, look, you know, thanks for the grant. Um, I know it's for the school, but we've just kind of done the middle bit, can we have some more money? And they got it. And so they had several phases. Um, and it's completely transformed the school. I mean, it really is a case where architecture has changed things. And the centre of this school is this wonderful space. And what was fun here is that Alex and his team developed this, uh, I'm sorry, the, it's on a stick so the video doesn't work, but do you, have you heard of the Moray effect? You know, when you get these graphic patterns that uh, interrupt with each other? Louis Vuitton copied us after this. You might have seen it, you Louis Vuitton shop. I mean, your students, you probably don't know about Louis Vuitton, but when you're architects... Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> forget it, sorry. <laughs> but uh, um, the, it's, it's quite interesting. And the problem was, and again, it's a bit like the age thing, but everyone get very worried that the children would go into epileptic shock when they saw the Moray effect. So we had to mock some panels up, and we mocked them up and moved them backwards and forwards and sort of rolled in various children of various ages and watched them. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, none of them had epileptic fits, and the job went ahead. But it's kind of on-site testing. I, I must recommend it. <laughs> um, that's the roof open and shut. And what's actually lovely about it is the whole thing shimmers. So when you walk under it, it's a little bit like a sequin dress or something. It's... It's all shimmering above your head. Lots of different shading. That's in New Zealand. 
Uh, this is in Singapore. And again, talking about climatic envelopes, you know, this, this is the river of ETFE. This is um, there's another very curious phenomenon. Most of the women I know in England want to go brown, you know, get suntanned. If you go to Singapore, all the women want to go white. And, and there's a real serious issue. I don't know why it is, but people will not go out in the sun in the midday. And this is a huge development. It's a theme park for Universal, and it's got a casino in it. And the, the thing only works because you protect the external environment. So we've got these huge solar canopies allowing people to use this space throughout the year. And all sorts of interesting patterns. And this one, which I like very much, this is really simple. This is just putting a piece of white foil and clear foil and white foil and doing the opposite on the other side. So it's like these ribbons that go across the top of the building. And you've got these kind of quite interesting things coming out with uh, shadow. And it was, this was, it was an interesting building because it suddenly made me realise that when you design things, or when we design things, we, we, we're experts at space and surface. And we're interested in designing these rooms and these environments and these processional ways. But then we'd have surface around them which encloses it. And suddenly I realised that what we're engaging with is we, we're talking about deep space. You know, it's quite ephemeral. It's three-dimensional, this surface, and it changes. So you don't actually really know where the boundaries are. And that's not something we're very comfortable with as architects. I, it, it's a root, something we need to explore more. But it's really interesting. It was exploited a little bit on this building. This is a, this is a complete fruitcake who I like very much. A very innovative, interesting guy. Enrique Rui. You must get him to talk here. Uh, he runs a, a practice called Cloud9, which is very appropriate for his practice. And this won the architectural thingy of the year last year. And it's of uh, Enrique Rui, Cloud9. He teach, he's got a unit and teaches at the AA. And he's, he's a really interesting guy, an interesting speaker. This, you sit in any of these offices in here and you can control the variable skin cushion on the computer in your room. Yeah? But what's fun is this facade. You can see this is a cable net, vertical cable net, uniaxial cables like you've seen before. But we came up together with a wonderful idea was that when the sun came out, in England you have clouds. So in Barcelona, when the sun comes up, we make clouds in the cushions. And that protects the people from the inside, from the solar gain. And you can see there a cloud trapped on a building which protects the inhabitants from the, from the, from the sun. And it's quite interesting. There's also a lovely cafe someone did on Lake Geneva or something. Somewhere in Switzerland, they, they have a cafe in a cloud. You go and have your cup of coffee, you get really cold. I don't think it's a great commercial excess, but it's a lovely concept. Every country is different. This is Greece. Uh, in Greece, you have a rule whereby the shopping mall, um, you, you, when you get planning permission, the shopping mall counts if it's covered, but doesn't count if it's not. So before the present crisis, there's a great market in making moving roofs. You know, it's a bit like the fire debate. And the planners come around, no roof. Planners go away, whack the roof on, guys, you know. Milk the punters. And you can see here this big moving roof here. In fact, fabric and foil. We're putting photovoltaics into cushions. We've just got granted, very recently, a three million euro grant to research printing photovoltaics onto cushions. And the goal is that all of these variable skins and printed shapes and stuff like that also harvest energy. If we do that, we've got the positive energy building. That should be a wonderful thing to do. At the moment, we're beginning to move into the buildings within a building. This kind of protection that's going on, the, the buttons, the fuller idea that's going on, these huge cladding panels. Here in Hanover, a single skin ETFE, in this case a stress membrane, 
protecting the facade. This is the biggest single skin application in the world. Here we've patterned the foil into an anti-clastic shape to take the wind loads. Whereas here on this little ski thingy, this is a, a single membrane foil with cables in it. And you can see the, the load bearing capacity of it. I think you asked about snow. This was an interesting building because you can see the amount of snow here. These are people. There's a glass end to it which broke under the snow load. The foil took the load. And I think the other thing, so I've talked a little bit about lightweight structures, I've talked a little bit about climatic envelopes, but you know, the other thing people do is they communicate, and buildings are beginning to do this. This is the Magna Project. It's actually a very interesting structure, but this won the Sterling Prize with uh, Chris Wilkinson some years ago. But it was really beginning to use light and colour on a membrane that holds it. Exploited at Canary Wharf Station, the Paris uh, uh, Motor Show with this, uh, uh, this concept of giving birth to a new car. What an idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit like, you know, you go to the, the garage and you put this kind of shitty stuff in your car and you look up there, there's a green flower. And you think, ah, the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, the contradictions of capitalism is extraordinary. Well, here in, um, in uh, uh, this is in Melbourne, a shopping centre changing colour. This is downtown Bangkok. Um, a big facade here. We've just done a, two or three projects here. And Herzog and de Murion, uh, Basel Stadia. Here with these huge letters. This is red foil and matte foil in, in one cushion. You can see it here to kind of I don't know, show the buildings there, I suppose. Basel. If you didn't know it was Basel, you do now. Um, and you can see how it's changed by putting light onto it. So you've got this play between what's permanent and what's ephemeral, which is really quite interesting, you know? Or well, here, this is actually a commercial disaster. This is a, an entrance canopy to an entertainment centre in Adelaide. And these cushions all change colour all the time, so they kind of have these kind of weird, wacky sequences where you know, it goes red and blue and yellow and the spirals and stripes and what have you. And it's designed to attract everybody into the entertainment centre. In reality, what they do is they sit around and watch the entrance. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, you know, it's just... I think it's wonderful. <laughs> and here, this is interesting. Here we have developed a system where we can uh, create a grid, a wiring loom inside a cushion with LEDs, and we can address any one of them. So you can make a, a, like a huge television screen. You can make your building talk visually. And you can see here, this is a a building we're doing up in Moscow, a huge podium on a building where the building I is basically being used for graphics. You all know Eden, but I mean, Eden for us was memorable. I think we had three people in the office when we got this project. And the Calpines came round to interview us and you know, I got all my friends round with their computers and we managed to get 10 in the office by the time they came round. And we got the contract. Um, it's an extraordinary project. This really catapulted the technology onto the world stage. And this is when we just built it. You can see the scale, the digger there, 130 <coughs> meters, something like that. The building is, li is he the building is lighter than the weight of air inside it. And I think the Millennium Dome also uh, manages to achieve that. But this was on after one year with uh, plant growth. And year two, you have climate. So it's quite an extraordinary place. If you haven't been there, do. It's one of these buildings that has not only changed my world, because it did, but this changed Cornwall. This uh, makes one million people go to Cornwall that didn't go before. So it's completely changed the economy of that part of Britain. 
And this is interesting. You see, uh, this is the ETFE, this is aluminium, this is steel, and this is glass. And you see how this has attracted algae growth, as has this and this. This hasn't. The ETFE self-cleanses under the action of rain. And in, in even inside here, it takes a lot longer to get dirtier because it's got a really smooth surface and a very low friction coefficient. And again, Eden's nicely lit. And this was the opening party, which was one of those parties. You kind of remember it, you know. And it took us into this little project. This is the water cube. Um, and I also thought this was a stunning project because um, this was commissioned by the Chinese government. A series of designs for both the bird's nest and the water cube. And they publicised these designs before they bought them. And then they had to look around the world to find out how are we going to build these things. And they just thought, shit, there's Ben the other side of the world. We don't really have many choices. And you know, this was Chinese national pride was in the hands of a very little company the other side of the world. And they were very intelligent about how they interviewed us and put us together with uh, a, a major contractor in China. And we had to set up a factory and build this amazing project. Designed around a concept called wheels, feel and foam. You see it's a giant space frame with uh, four and five layer cushions in the roof and two and three layers here. And this big cavity is sealed in the winter to keep the insulation up and then opened in the summer to vent heat gain. So it's quite a responsive building. That's the Olympic pool with a bit of a lens on it. And this is a really wonderful place. I don't know what the designers were on, but I wish I had some. <laughs> it's extraordinary. <laughs> This is my youth, <laughs> my studenthood. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> this is the leisure pool. You go there. This is the only, I mean, talk about legacy. This is the only one of the Chinese projects that make any money. They look at the stadium and think, what do we do with this? You know? <laughs> and I talked a little bit about how the surface changes. And what's interesting here, you can see how it's changing through different um, light levels, infinite space to stainless steel to kind of um, wacky graphics. This bubble bar just goes on forever. It's an extraordinary building. Sometime go to Beijing. And it took us really into the world of Stadia. This is, uh, this is the All Black, Blacks in, uh, uh, down in New Zealand as part of the Rugby World Cup. And again, using light you know, to radiate the cushions. It's, it's the electric kind of purple. Using for facades. And this building, which is really interesting, this is Carisbrook Stadia. And what's interesting about this, this is the very first stadia ever built in the world, which is completely enclosed with a natural grass pitch. And if you go to places like Cardiff, they get, you have two or three pitches and they kind of take them in and out with forklift trucks. Grand Stadia in Paris does the same. Grass grows under ETFE. It does not grow under glass. So it's a unique attribute of this technology. It's phenomenal for growing stuff under. And you know, one of the problems they have is it grows really quickly. So they have to mow it a lot, which they moan about. The moaning mower. But it's wonderful for big sports occasions, you know, because the, the energy in that space, you know, you, I mean, those of you who've been to stadium and sports facilities, you, you, there's kind of containment to it. We went on to build this. This is the uh, little stadium in Qatar, which they used to win the World Cup. Big moving roof. I mean, this thing rotates. In fact, David did the engineering on this. I keep punting you, don't you? And Abigail, who's sitting beside him. <laughs> Um, and another little project we're doing in Singapore. This is National Stadia there. And one of the things that's really interesting we found in this, because we did a lot of research about human comfort levels, is, is the way these stadia work, let's go back here, is that they, 
in these very hot climates is they pump cold air out underneath your bums. And it kind of flows down the bowl onto the pitch so the players wander around in it and feel OK and kick the ball and do their stuff. But your comfort is, is the product of two things. One, one, the air temperature that you're in, but also the radiant temperature of all of the surfaces around you. So if you're in a cold temperature but all of that's hot, you feel really miserable. And that's why if you're under crinkly tin buildings or fabric buildings in hot climates, you don't feel very comfortable. But the lovely thing about a cushion is it's multi-layered. So you get rid of the sun here, you get rid of the infrared here, and you keep the surface cool, and that makes you feel cool, which is what people like to do. This is Tianjin Stadia, which we're on site with at the moment. Another changing colour one. And this funny old building, this is, um, you probably see the scale of it. You see that thing there? That's about eight storeys. This is four tower buildings. This is a computer picture. This idea was let's enclose four tower bu buildings in a big kind of climatic envelope. And uh, they went and did it, uh, all covered in ETFE. You can, again, look at the scale. You know, this is contextualism, <laughs> being sensitive. The roof has got these hot wires in it. It fails if there's a fire. And this is some idea of the space inside. It's just ginormous, you know. It's got hotels in it. It's got commercial offices in it. It's got shopping in it and art galleries and people's houses. And you can go up to the top and have a barbecue. I mean, it's got everything you want, if you like that kind of stuff. And I think Google Earth are just moving in there now to... Uh, uh, you know, to be in Beijing. And incidentally, this is the very first platinum lead building in China, which is the environmental accreditation. This is the um, Seoul, in Seoul, in Korea. Um, and these things here, in, this is the um, city hall. These kind of weird airships we built. This is looking up an extraordinary space. It's actually horrid. It's way overcomplicated. But it is extraordinary. And this is inside one of these airships. This is ETFE, white and clear. And they're doing some filming yeah, thing. Yeah, you have to come over to Brick Lane and 50p a square centimetre. <laughs> And we do some funny ones. This is, um, this is a roundabout in Beijing. Quite why we did it, I don't know, but I think it's fun. And the Abu Dhabi control tower. And of course, Kazakhstan, which is, again, the Buckminster Fuller Dome. This is, I think, the biggest tent in the world. Um, Norman Foster, huge cable net. Great problems about how you erect this. I mean, to get materials there, it takes three weeks to get them there on a train. It's one of the most harshest climates in the world. As I said, it's 90 degrees between top and bottom. These little things that people here. And really what they wanted is they wanted to have a space where they can be cool in the summer and warm in the winter. I mean, it, you know, why live in Kazakhstan? If you go outside, it's, you know, if you want to sit there over a hole in the ice kind of catching fish, that's fine, but... Not everybody wants to do that all the time. That was the opening ceremony. And actually, it's quite interesting, because talk about uh, engineering. I mean, this is a cable net. So this thing is actually moves up and down by about four meters when it's windy. And you can see, do you, you know stretcher bond brick? You see how the cushions are like this, but there's a joint here and a joint there and a joint there? It's because this whole facade can open and shut and accommodate the movement. These uh, spaces are swimming pools. It's got a monorail in there. It runs around here somewhere. And that's inside one of the swimming pools. You see, you go and sit in the sand here and drink your pina colada and think of oil. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we haven't done that one yet. But, uh, we're actually talking with someone 
do a scheme a little bit like this at the moment. But that's ETFE, and that's the sort of stuff that's being built around the world. Um, these very big span, lightweight, climatic envelopes is the sort of movement of what we do. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Can we can we pump this with kind of like a um, mobile gap scripting all this to get it in the morning? Yeah, you can. But the problem is, is it's fairly thin and it's relatively porous. So, for instance, we did one with helium a while ago because a client of us wanted their roof to fly off in the Millennium Man and look cool, and that.